How's the sound? Getting some thumbs up from the back. That's good. Not having any feedback. Good to go? Great. Okay. So last time, last time I discussed some, some, some general tools which one requires if you want to try to perform constructions like Hochschild homology in greater generality when you can't just write down explicit complexes for things. So we discussed this notion of a cyclic object, how it leads to the concept of S1 acting on something algebraic like a complex or similar, and how you can then pass from this action to homology, cohomology, and a Tate construction. And that in the case we know and love that we plugged in Hochschild homology and saw some complexes, then these abstract constructions output what we'd constructed in the earlier lectures, cyclic homology, negative cyclic homology, and periodic cyclic homology. But I don't think I did a very good job of explaining why we want to try to perform this construction in some greater degree of generality and what information we can expect to, to extract from it. So I'd like to start by discussing that. So let's consider, as we have previously, some K algebra A. Then so far, say we've been looking at, say, complexes of K modules, and we've been tensoring things together over K. And in this world is where we built the Hochschild homology of A over K. So we wrote this down in some explicit fashion and produced for us a complex of K modules. And we saw, or at least I hope I managed to convince you, that it has some interesting properties. Now, let me very abusively draw an inclusion here and suppose that instead of thinking about complexes of K modules, we just pretend, well, we don't need to pretend any complex of K modules is a, a complex of abelian groups. And instead of tensoring things over K, I could tensor things over Z. Now, my K module is, of course, so excuse me, my K algebra A is, of course, also a Z algebra. That is to say, a ring. I, I forget the K linear structure on it. And then I can repeat the construction and get Hochschild homology of A just viewed as a Z algebra. So I'm doing the same thing, but the tensor products are now tensor products over Z. <coughs> Now, is either of these better than the other? The answer is yes. I claim that this one at the bottom is well, richer in some sense than the one at the top. So to justify this, let me explain to you that you can recover the first construction from the second construction. So the second construction somehow, if we're working over Z, it does it knows at least as much as the first one. And one can do that as follows. I claim that I can recover the Hochschild homology of A over K from the Hochschild homology of A over Z by tensoring it through the, tensoring it over the Hochschild homology of K over Z. K is in particular a Z algebra, so I can form that. It's, well, let's come back to what it is. And I'm going to tensor it down to K. So to really make sense of this object, <coughs> It's probably cleanest to just view everything as a, as a simplicial ring, and then we can tensor together simplicial rings by just tensoring what happens term-wise. And then this, well, in fact, this equality will be an on-the-nose equality in this case, in which I'm imagining that I have lots of flatness conditions, and otherwise it would just be some equivalence. So let me, let's, to make sure that we all follow what's happening, let's check this identification. Well, the left-hand side is built out of things that look like A, tensor over k. Oh, I think I should do this the other way around. There's not going to be enough space. No, I know how to do it. Okay. The left-hand side is built out of things that look like these multiple tensors. And the right-hand side is built out of things that look like a tensor over z lots of times. And then what's happening downstairs, this thing downstairs is built out of lots of tensors of k over Z. And then tensoring down to K by the multiplication map. I claim that these two things are the same. Well, I've certainly got a map going from the bottom to the top. 
by replacing tensor over Z by tensor over Ks. But I can also go the other direction. I mean, if I try to, if I map some symbol, say A0 times yada yada times AN into the bottom, well, then the fact that I'm modding out by the kernel of this multiplication map exactly imposes K linearity between the tensor symbols. So that will actually be a K by linear map, will then produce for me a map on the tensor products over K, and that will invert the first map. So these things are really equal just by formal nonsense about behavior of tensor products. And that will then produce for me this identification that lets me recover the initial Hochschild homology over K from the therefore richer Hochschild homology over Z. So we can try to continue this process. Having obtained more information by replacing K by A, how far can we go? So can we but a not equality, can we find some strictly richer world? Where I can perform the same constructions, which will yield me some even richer output. And so what sort of structure do we need on this gadget in order to be able to perform the construction of Hochschild homology? Well, I've already written a tensor here. So that is to mean I want some sort of symmetric monoidal structure. But that, as I say, is just a way of imposing the condition that I have some tensor, which satisfies the rules that I know and love. I guess you need some categorical properties on it. I'd want something like limits and co-limits to exist, because once we've got Hochschild homology, then we want to be able to form the cyclic homology, the periodic cyclic homology, and so on. And as I explained last time, to give a general construction of these, you have to take limits over horrible diagrams involving the classifying space of S1. Probably one wants to add some other technical conditions. Um, and finally, we have to be in some reasonably homotopically rich framework. Um, I mean, up at the top level in these derived categories, we've produced complexes. We've been interested sometimes in quasi-isomorphisms and equivalence, but in equivalences between these complexes. So I don't just want some naive category. I mean, as a first guess, we could look at something that is similar to these derived categories, maybe a DG category. So that, that could be a first approximation to the question. Can I find some, some differential graded category, equipped to the well-behaved tensor product, strictly richer than D of Z, I'll carry out my construction of Hochschild homology there, I'll get something so rich that I can solve the Riemann hypothesis. Is this possible? Well, if those are the sort of conditions that I impose on myself, then the answer is no. We can't do better than DZ. So one has a precise, in the world of DG categories, one has a characterization of DZ is being initial in some suitable sense, so that if I produce any other such symmetric monoidal DG category with sufficiently rich properties, then by tensoring, I'll be able to map from D to Z into it, and I'll get a restriction inclusion in the other direction, like these restrictions here. And that shows that I can't build anything better than DZ with these sorts of properties. So we've got to relax this type of DG condition on the category, We've got to discard the sort of strong linearity conditions that appear in that world and ask instead for something like a simplicial or an infinity category, in which, as I say, we no longer have such strong linearity conditions on the Homs. And then we can do better. And the best we can do. is this category of spectra, which you're supposed to think of as some derived category over the sphere spectrum. And that, as I say, really is as far as one can go in the sense that there's an analogous uh, theorem that this has, a, has, a, has an initial property similar to what I said for DZ a moment ago. And so if I produced any other sufficiently rich category, which was symmetric monoidal, and as I say, had these had sufficiently rich properties to carry out this sort of construction of Hochschild homology, well then, it would already include a copy of spectra, excuse me, it would already be including inside a copy of spectra, 
And so we can't do better than that. And so it was really an idea of, I would say, of Goodwillie and Waldhausen at the, at the end of the 80s and early 90s that one should try to transport this construction of Hochschild homology beyond this familiar algebraic case and into the world of spectra and ring spectra where we expect by repeating the construction to get better information. So let me explain what better information could mean. So here are a couple of pathologies. Well, this is, let's suppose that we're just interested in studying FP. So I can form then the periodic cyclic homology. In fact, let's just look at what's happening in degree zero. I can form the periodic cyclic homology of FP over FP. Okay, and that will in fact just give me an FP. I've got lots of tensor products of FPs over FPs. Everything collapses to FP. I could also form the periodic cyclic homology of FP over Z, so that's what I've claimed could conceivably be richer, and this I need to do in a sufficiently sensible way. If I just take tensor products of FP with itself over Z, in the naive sense, then these again just collapse to FPs. But if I adopt a nice derived framework, and I replace all of these tensor products by derived tensor products, then uh, copies of FP can start to build up, and they can sufficiently build up so that this will produce for me well, what we'd like to say is that it produces for me a copy of ZP, but it actually produces for me a copy of ZP plus junk. Junk is a technical term. That means I don't want it. Uh, in fact, this junk is really bad. So if we remember that the periodic cyclic homology is built out of sort of piling up lots of copies of cyclic homology shifted by different degrees, then what happens is that in these copies of cyclic homology, you get z mod p to the n's at different stages, and that would be great. They build up to give me this zp, but then at each finite stage, you already have a piece of junk. And it's a theorem that an inverse limit of junk is still junk. In fact, it's worse junk, because at each z mod p to the n, I mean, at each level n stage, like maybe you differ from this z mod p to the n by something controllable, but then when you take this limit, you even get some bit of junk that is not killed by a power of p. So you get some extra junky ZP modules appearing. And that's what we really want to kill. And that's exactly what's going to happen when we pass and we repeat our constructions in the world of spectra. Spectra, again, another technical theorem, will kill this. And that's what I'd like to explain to you today, hopefully justifying that once we repeat these worlds, in this homotopical framework, excuse me, in this topological framework of spectra, then we're better off than we were before. So that, as I say, is what I'm going to focus on today. Topological Hochschild homology, etc. Maybe I should just, maybe I should have added a, come back to this, topological Hochschild homology, et cetera, of, let's say, FP algebras. So the big theorem that gets the ball rolling, without which we can't do very much, and which unfortunately I don't want to say very much about, I mean, it's, it's really the key, in some sense it's the key, it is the key starting point, and it's a, it's a result which is very much not algebra. Once we've got this on the board, which I'm going to use as a black box, then all of the manipulations today I will try to present in a very algebraic fashion. I'll try to convince you that once you get over the psychological obstacle that these objects look unfamiliar, you can in fact manipulate them using algebra, very algebraic techniques. But one needs this initial input to get things started. So let's, I want, this is the reminder I wanted to put down. So topological Hochschild homology, this means that we're performing our Hochschild homology construction in this world of spectra, which is somehow as rich as we can go over the sphere spectrum. Then the topological Hochschild homology 
Oh, let me see. Let me, I wanted to write odd here so I can compute the, the homotopy groups of this spectrum, and they all vanish in odd degree. That's something that we saw in the case of Hoxhall homology was nice. And even better, when I look at what's happening in even degree, I just look like a polynomial algebra. I guess I should say U is non, maybe that's automatic, U is non-zero class in FP. So I mean more canonically, the THH2 of FP, it just looks like a, a one-dimensional FP vector space, I, and then I pick some generator for it, and this gives me all of the other even Hoxhall homology groups with multiplication, uh, excuse me, with multiplication just given in a polynomial fashion. So all the odd ones, all the odd homotopy groups just look like a copy of FP. It's the first thing to read off, and multiplication behaves as nicely as possible. And so here are some free consequences of this theorem. Uh, so the first, though, for any FP algebra now, We get a, a fiber sequence, or if you prefer, a, a distinguished triangle relating the topological Hochschild homology of A, which is going to be shifted by a little bit, the topological Hochschild homology of A again, and here I multiply by this generator U that I've got sitting in THH2 of FP, and what's left will be a copy of the Hochschild homology of A over FP in the usual sense that we've come to know and love. So let me explain where this comes from. So if we believe that this style of manipulation continues to work in the world of spectra, then I can write the Hochschild homology of A over FP as being the Hochschild homology of A over S, that is to say, THH of A, tensor through the Hochschild homology of FP over S, that is to say, THH of FP, down to FP. Here I'm just repeating the formula here, which is in fact witnessing that the Hochschild homology, excuse me, that the topological Hochschild homology of A is something strictly richer than the Hochschild homology of A over FP. We can recover the former from the latter. But we can read off this theorem of Birkstead that in order to kill all of THH of FP, Apart from this initial FP in degree zero, all I have to do is kill U. When I kill this class U, it's killing what happens in all of the higher homotopies. And so this just looks like THH of A killing this class U. So I adopt some slightly informal abusive algebraic notation, but I'm trying to convince you that to some extent that's allowed in this game. And so that indeed produces for me a representation of the Hochschild homology of A over FP that we've been studying in the first two talks in terms of the topological theory modulo this, this class. So let's now take homotopy groups, return to the familiar world of uh, abelian groups, and see what this buys us. So in low degrees, okay, I'm going to get THH0 of A looks like HH0 of A over FP, and that we know is just A. So I'm computing the, the long exact sequence for the homotopy groups, so I run up like this, and all of these things are supported homotopically in positive degree. So I don't get anything here yet, and then I get an HH1, a THH1, and again, nothing there yet. So I can compare my HH1 of A over FP 
that we computed in the very first talk to be omega 1 of A over FP. And this will again match up with THH1 of A. So far, it looks like it wasn't worth doing all this work. But now something will start to happen. So continuing to run along this long exact sequence, I'll get an HH, oh, it's hard to count, 2 of A over FP. That's going to 0. Then we'll have a THH2 of A. Then we'll have a THH0 of A that we've already computed as A. Then we'll have an HH3. Maybe I stopped writing the A over FP. And then THH3. And then a THH of 1 that we've already computed to be omega 1. And so on. And so we see that we get a little bit of coarse information about the topological Hoxhill homology groups just from this formalism. In particular, we see that in some sense, the THHs are built up out of multiple copies of the HHs. Well, not much is going on in low degree. Then we just begin to identify them. But then we see that if we go to THH of 2, we're somehow getting a contribution from HH2, and we're also getting this contribution that came from, in fact, from HH0. <laughs> And then if we go up to THH of 3, we're getting some contribution from HH3 and a THH of 1, which looks like an HH1. And if we go even further up, well, then we see that each copy of THH is, is encoding some data about all of the lower HHs and building them together in some fashion. And the case in which one can most clearly see the way in which this information builds up in topological Hochschild homology is the case of a smooth algebra. So we explicitly computed, it was this hochschild constant rosenberg theorem in the first talk, how the Hochschild homology groups of a smooth algebra, in fact, of any smooth K algebra for any K looked. And that has this an analogous result in this, com in this context of topological Hochschild homology due to Hesselhalt. So we call it Hesselholtz Hochschild constant Rosenberg theorem. It says the following so if A is a smooth FP algebra, then if I look at the graded algebra <laughs> consisting of all the topological Hochschild homology groups of A, it looks very simple. It's built out of a bunch of differential forms, as we usually see in these Hochschild constant Rosenberg statements. But then necessarily, of course, I've also got contributions just by functoriality coming from THH of FP. I have FP mapping to A, so I have THH of FP mapping to THH of A. This is also going to produce some elements. And we know that those contributions look like some polynomial algebra. So let me unravel what this means at the level of individual homotopy groups. It tells me that each THH of N is not simply a single omega N, but it looks like a big direct sum as I runs between 0 and n over 2, or more precisely the floor function of n over 2, of a bunch of omega n minus 2i's of A over Fp. So each topological Hoxhill homology group, as I say, is seeing a whole collection of differential forms. So let's prove this formally from the long exact sequence that I've written down. Um, so we have some bit of the sequence that's going to look like THH N of A mapping to HHN of A over FP 
and then I'll have a THH of N minus 2. This is how a typical bit in the long exact sequence looks, and then a priori, these continue in both directions. But now let's come back here. We've seen that THH1 is in fact just a copy of omega 1. So then by the multiplicative structure on the homotopy groups, I'm going to get for free, well firstly let's recall that I have this isomorphism, this classical HKR isomorphism. between omega n and the Hochschild homology. But then as I say, because THH of 1 is seeing a copy of omega 1, the multiplicative structure will produce for me, just as it did in the classical theory, a map from omega n into THH of n. It's by multiplying together n times this map from omega 1 into THH 1. Well, and that then shows me that this map here is necessarily surjective. In other words, this long exact sequence that we wrote down, splicing together THH from copies of HH, this just breaks into short exact sequences. So I can add a zero here, and I can add a zero here, using at the same time the surjectivity at levels n plus one. And now the result's gonna follow by induction. I mean, we've already got it in degrees zero and one, and so as we run up this sequence, we'll see that as long as THH of n minus 2 has the correct description in this way, then in order to pass the THH of n, I just need to add a copy of omega n. And everything will exactly build up in that, in that fashion. And this may initially look somewhat bizarre that... I mean, it was very attractive that in Hochschild homology that each group was just given by a bunch of differential forms in the expected degree. See, so we've got a whole bunch shifted in different degrees. But this actually works out perfectly. And what we'll do in a moment is we'll begin to study the, the topological periodic cyclic homology, which is then built by, and as we've seen, by, by, by somehow taking the limit over multiple copies of cyclic homology piled on top of one another. And what will happen is that all these piles of differential forms will exactly align to sit on top of one another and produce, in the limit, crystalline cohomology, which is indeed built out of, well, if you view crystalline cohomology as represented by the, by the duran witt complex, then you have this, say, canonical piatic filtration on the duran witt complex, and all of the pieces of this, they look like copies of the Duram complex of your original algebra. And so we need all these additional copies of the Duram complex at the starting point in order to build up correctly to get to something interesting like crystalline cohomology. So we need to begin going in the direction of the, as I say, of the periodic theory so let's analyze topological periodic cyclic homology of FP. So recall that this is done by taking THH of FP and performing this Tate S1 construction to it, which you should think of then as being the periodic cyclic homology of FP in this world of spectra. And indeed, this analogy holds sufficiently well, so if you recall in the, the, in the algebraic setup, we define the periodic cyclic homology in terms of this double complex, this explicit double complex, which produces for you in particular some spectral sequence converging from the homology of the columns, that is to say the Hochschild homology groups, and going to the periodic cyclic homology. And there's Similarly, a spectral sequence associated to this Tate construction, which will look exactly the same. Indeed, I'm going to re-index it so that it really does, it does look exactly the same, possibly to the horror of topologists in the audience. Um, but I think, by analogy with the algebraic case, this will be cleaner. So let me have an FP, a zero, a zero. I'm going to put, oh, I've already messed it up. Ah, oh, spectral sequences are hard. 
Uh, no, I can turn this into a P, and that's an F. Oh, genius. 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 Look at that. I didn't do anything. No, no problem. Fantastic. Uh, okay, these continue. Let me see. Maybe I add another one just to convince you that I know what I'm doing. Uh, these will continue. So what I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw the Hochschild homology groups going up all the columns, just as we had in this bicomplex defining classical periodic cyclic homology. So I'll have <coughs> FP is zero. These are really going to stay zero, as I promise. Uh, and then here I have an FPU. Here I have an FPU. These are, I'm sorry, they're not supposed to be shrinking. FPU, zero. Zero, zero, F, P, U squared. Maybe that's enough because things are only going to, you see I'm not an expert at spectral sequences. Uh, it continues like this. Maybe you get the idea. So I'm trying to draw, uh, and everything down here is zero. So I'm trying to draw some, uh, it's supposed to be supported in this diagonal up there. Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> It looks better from my uh, perspective. Uh, well, you want to come up here and look at it instead. It's not so bad. Okay, so I'm trying to draw this di diagonally supported spectral sequence where all of the, as I say, all of the columns are just my, my Hochschild homology groups of FP. And we know by this theorem of Birkstead that those are vanishing at odd degree and that in even degree each of them is just a copy of FP. And I keep track of this U so that we can remember something about how the multiplication behaves. So these multiply just according to, to polynomial multiplication. And this will converge to, uh, excuse me, let me adopt correct notation. So I mean, these will converge to the topological periodic cyclic homology groups of FP in such a way, I mean, I don't think there's a single actual honest diagonal anywhere in this diagram, but in principle, so things are adding up this way in the spectral sequence, same as they did in the, in the theory of, in the classical theory. So in particular, oh boy, let me kind of have another color. So in particular, this is the piece. Which contributes to TP zero of FP. Maybe that gives some better idea of what's happening. Um, so firstly, there's, no, well, there's lots of room for differentials because I've drawn it so badly, but uh, in fact, there's no room for differentials. Everything is supported in even by degree. So all differentials in the spectral sequence on every page either come from something, either they either come from something zero or they go into something zero. There's no, no differentials. So to understand the topological periodic cyclic homology groups, you just need to solve some extension problems. So in particular, we can read off the spectral sequence formally For example, so because the odd groups are vanishing, then again, by analogy with this point that I made several times in the classical theory, we just really need to understand what's going on in. I mean, most of the information in this theory is encoded in TP0 of FP, and we can see, so this is going to be some complete filtered ring whose steps of the filtration are given by these terms running up. I mean, that's exactly how the spectral sequence works. The steps here are describing the graded piece of the abutment filtration on TP0. So we can read off that this is some complete filtered ring with associated graded given by FP polynomials U. The question then is, what can it be? So how can we add up copies of FP in various degrees, in various shifts, to get a ring? Well, there are really two possibilities. I think maybe there are really only two possibilities, or maybe something pathological could happen. No, I think it couldn't. Because of the multiplicative structure, there really are only two possibilities. Either uh, we failed, and these things are building up to give us a copy of FP power series U, or they're building up to give us a copy of ZP. ZP and no extra junk. And fortunately, life is good, and this is what we get. It's 
So let me write that down and label it. Maybe. Theorem. Now this is not a particularly difficult theorem to check. So what one needs to do, as I say, the goal is just to solve some extension problem related to this spectral sequence. So in particular, we have this class U here, which is going to give us some element in the first step of the filtration in TP0. And there were two things that it could do, according to these two possibilities. Either it's getting sent to some element of TP0, which is killed by P. That's what would happen in the first case. Or it's getting sent, in fact, to P, more or less, or to some multiple of P. I mean, TP0 is a ring. It does contain P, and it could get sent to it. So you've got to solve this extension problem and determine where U goes just in this very low degree part of the spectral sequence. And now if we come, down to the, come back to this sort of phenomenon that we saw a moment ago, we see that topological Hox filter homology is surprisingly close to Hox filter homology, classical Hox filter homology in very low degrees. And so in the sort of low degrees that control this extension problem, you can actually work with classical Hox filter homology. And so you resolve some extension problem that takes place at the level of classical Hox filter homology, and that gives you just the necessary piece of information to determine that you, you that's not this, that's this you, not you, you, that you behaves uh, as I say, in the expected way in the first step of the filtration. So it's a, it's a theorem about the classical theory. So, excuse me, it's a theorem about the topological theory, but in fact, uh, the work is done in the classical theory. And as previously, so as from Berkstead's theorem, we got some consequence for arbitrary FP algebras, we similarly are going to get some consequence for the topological periodic cyclic homology of all FP algebras just by knowing what happens in the case of FP. Maybe I should write down, because it's a nice formula. Should. In fact, what we've really shown, so we've shown that up along this anti-diagonal starting at the origin, we're adding up to a copy of FP. Yeah. So as I say, this is a calculation. That I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't explain it. I tried to justify that it's a calculation that you can do in classical Hoxhill homology because the extension problems in the very low degree of the spectral sequence are controlled by behavior in classical Hoxhill homology. But there you have to solve it. So as I was saying, I mean, what I've been discussing here is that along the anti-diagonal, we're adding up to a copy of ZP. But this is, of course, true along every anti-diagonal. The spectral sequence is periodic. And so, in fact, we compute that the topological periodic cyclic homology groups of FP just look like ZP, say, sigma plus or minus 1, where sigma is any generator of the free ZP module TP2 of FP. So this topological periodic cyclic homology of FP is a nice two-periodic cohomology theory. And here then are the consequences for an arbitrary FP algebra. So if I take the topological periodic cyclic homology of A and I go mod P, then it recovers for me the periodic cyclic homology of A over FP. And this is somehow the big payoff that perhaps justifies that we haven't messed up too badly in this periodic cyclic homology, I'll come back in a moment and explain how one, how one gets this consequence. First, I want to explain why it's nice. So we know that periodic cyclic homology is closely related to Duram cohomology, particularly if we plug in a smooth algebra. This is a type of result that I explained in the second lecture. 
that the periodic cyclic homology will in fact really just be built out of copies of the Durham cohomology of our smooth algebra. And what this statement is saying is that TP of A is a mixed characteristic lift of the periodic cyclic homology. Indeed, we know that TP of A, so this lives over TP of FP, whose zero homotopy is ZP. So this TP of A is living over ZP, in some sense. And mod P, it's recovering for us classical periodic cyclic homology, which is related to Durham cohomology. So it's producing for us some functorial lift to mixed characteristic of something related to Durham cohomology. And that's what will turn out to be crystalline cohomology. But it's worth mentioning that the, as I say, this is a statement that in fact holds for an arbitrary FP algebra. So if you're so inclined, you could plug in some singular ring and it's giving you then some canonical mixed characteristic lift of the periodic cyclic homology in that case. Or you can adopt the, 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 say the original point of view on periodic cyclic homology, which is that even for non-commutative rings, you should view it as some replacement of Durham cohomology. And then this theorem is telling us that even if I take some non-commutative FP algebra and I think about the right-hand side as a replacement for Durham cohomology in the non-commutative world, even that has some functorial nice mixed characteristic lift to ZP. As far as I'm aware, I mean, this point of view of existence of non-commutative non crystalline cohomology has not really been has not really been explored. So I just wanted to sketch, again from a very algebraic point of view, how one gets this consequence. So we saw from Berkstead's theorem that THH of A shifted by two goes to THH of A goes to HH of A over FP. And this, at least if we carefully choose this, exactly how we multiply by U, which one can do from the previous description of topological periodic cyclic homology, then this will be compatible with the cyclic structures everywhere, that is to say, the way in which S1 acts. And now we can take advantage of our perhaps slightly more highbrow point of view on how we construct TP and HP. We just apply this Tate cohomology construction everywhere, that's exact, and it will turn the first term into TP of A shifted by two, multiplying by U, going to TP of A, going to HP of A over FP. But this topological periodic cyclic homology of A well, this is periodic. This is, in fact, I should emphasize, is not automatic. If I plug in an arbitrary ring into this theory, then the output of the TP theory doesn't need to be too periodic, even though the word periodic appears in its title. But in this case of FP algebras, it is. That's something that we read off the structure of this spectral sequence where we see that we do indeed have such periodicity. Phenomena for FP itself, and hence also for anything over FP. So this looks like TP, doesn't matter whether I've shifted it two to the left, two to the right, or whatever, in such a way that multiplication by this U corresponds to multiplication by P. Indeed, that was more or less the extension problem that we had to solve in the original spectral sequence. We had to check that this class U, this in the first, in the first non-zero part of this anti-diagonal, was going to P in TP zero. And that corresponds to the fact that up to this shift, multiplication by U is really corresponding to multiplication by P. And so it's telling us that indeed, if I mod out by multiplication by P on TP, then I just collapse to HP, which is this initial statement that I wrote down. So why don't I get back now to what I was saying at the beginning. We see then that this topological theory is some mixed, character, mixed characteristic lift of HP, which in the smooth case,
and say particularly in the smooth case, corresponds to the Duram cohomology. And so we conclude that TP of A is lift to ZP of okay, something related to Duram cohomology. That's very imprecise. I regret writing this. Something related to Duram cohomology. And what will turn out to be true is that this TP of A is in fact essentially looking like crystalline cohomology. Uh, so crystalline cohomology, let me say a word about that. So Duram cohomology, that's of course just the Duram complex of A over FP, and the crystalline cohomology of an FP algebra. So I suppose it would be useful to have some notation for this. Let me adopt a sort of reasonably derived piece of notation. So I'll call it R gamma Chris of A over ZP. What this means concretely, and I write it as a definition, is that I take the Duram complex of A tilde over ZP, where A tilde is a, any smooth algebra over ZP lifting A. So this is the classical theory of crystalline cohomology that inputs an FP algebra and it outputs the Duram cohomology of any lift of that smooth algebra to ZP. The problem is you can't, of course, adopt this quite as a definition of crystalline cohomology because it manifestly, or a, no, in fact, it doesn't depend on the chosen lift, but a priori it does. And so the theory tells you that, in fact, in fact, it does not. So one way, what I suppose we could see that is by comparing to what happens in topological periodic cyclic homology, that that's a little bit overkill. So I think since I'm talking again this afternoon and I have maybe just a couple of minutes left, like I said, then I'm going to stop here and I'll start this afternoon by explaining more closely this comparison between TP and crystalline cohomology, and then we'll pass on to see some analogous statements in which instead of plugging FP algebras into this machinery, I plug in ZP algebras. Okay, thanks very much. Any questions? Okay. So the, the question was whether it's clear that there always exists some smooth lift. And in the case in which I plug in a ring, it's not clear, but it does always exist. But this is, a, uh, this is only an affine statement. So you then went on to ask whether such a lift would also exist in the case of, let's say, of a projective variety over FP, and then the answer is certainly not. And so that's, in some sense, precisely the point of crystalline cohomology. It tells me that if I, in the affine case, I can lift my algebra to some smooth ZP algebra, I can define this cohomology theory as being the Duram cohomology of the lift, but how can I possibly glue this construction in the case in which my variety is non-liftable? And crystalline cohomology says that, in fact, it can be done. Okay, I have a question. So uh, what if your A is a perfect algebra over FP? What are the TP and the THAs? That's a great question. Maybe I should have said that. So I can add it. Wait, how does it? So if I bring it back, I'm supposed to bring it back here before modifying it, aren't I? So more, maybe I can also do THH. Why don't I just answer the question orally, in fact? Uh, so if I replace FP by any perfect FP algebra, then everything that I said is true as long as I replace ZP by the ring of width vectors of that perfect FP algebra.
Uh, I'll repeat the question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Does the formation of um, T, P of A commute with base change, like modding out by P? No. So is, is TP of a left a left of TP? TP of a left, left of TP, no. <laughs> okay. More interesting things happen. Are you making any claims about whether TP of A has P torsion, like the homotopy groups, when you say it's a mixed characteristic lift? Am I making any such claims? Um, I don't think I made any such claim. So then maybe I should, what do I mean by mixed characteristic lift? Okay, so in the, uh, I mean that when I take a derived mod P, I recover this thing. But a priori, there's no reason why there couldn't also be some P torsion phenomena happening in TP. I would say that in fact, yes, indeed that will happen. I mean, when, even in the theory of crystalline cohomology, even in some, some nice case in which you have a smooth projective variety over FP, you can see some very strange torsion phenomena happening in the crystalline cohomology over ZP. So we'll see that this TP is built out of these crystalline cohomologies in some sense, and these could indeed contain lots of torsion information. And in fact, in some sense, this is not really very well understood, torsion in crystalline cohomology, and that, that will show up in TP. So judging, judging from your formula for smooth algebra, it seems that TP and TH has etal descent. Is it always true? Yes, it even has flat descent. Any further questions? So just a technical question. Uh, uh, when you have the HP of A over FP, do you mean the one where you take the derived tensor products of the FP or just the regular tensor product? Because when you divide FP over FP, it was derived tensor products. But what we talked about in lecture two was regular tensor products. So fortunately, every algebra over a field is flat because FP is a field. So over FP, derived tensor and usual tensor products are the same. So in fact, what you say about FP over FP is not correct. When you compute HP of FP over FP, I do it using usual tensor products. When I did FP over Z, then I really have to take derived tensor products. Before, as I say, when you're working over FP, you don't need to worry about the difference. Um, in general, in general, the answer to your question is that everything should involve derived tensor products. Otherwise, these sorts of formulae would not hold. Here, we just happen to be in a lucky enough case in which the derived and the usual tensor products coincide. So I guess if you, go, if you were to go back to the earlier question about replacing FP with some perfect ring. Then, then I would have to have derived tensor products. Further questions? If not, let's thank Matthew again.